Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thanks so much for joining. We really appreciate having you here today in this Executive Book Club. Um, that today we will be reviewing the book The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Gencioni. It is for us really a privilege to have you. Uh, we do this Executive Book Club where the premise is that we read for you. So every two weeks or so we present a book that um, either of us have read. Um, with commentary and it's not just necessarily to save you reading the book it's to give you a perspective we also do it um, for our students um, that have access to these recordings and also for you as an executive to take the time to reflect and for us as well as as leadership practitioners to to reflect um, some of us are more visual and auditory and this is an amazing opportunity then to connect with that so um, I am, as usual, uh, my name is Dr. Rian Steenberg. Um, I'm the Chief Academic Officer here at Stellenbosch Graduate Institute, and I'm joined by um, Fred Landman, the CEO, and we're also both directors at Edivos. And as always, we are very excited to have you. Um, hi, Fred. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Rian, I, I, I'm still Fred. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Um, so also, if you've got any questions or comments, observations, you're welcome to make those in the chat. We'll respond to that. Um, yeah, so let's get into it. Um, the five dysfunctions of a team. So I must admit, the first thing that I thought about the book is it's got a strange title because it means like, um, I don't know if it's a little bit of Scandinavian blood that I have in me somewhere. Um, but, you know, like talking about how to be dysfunctional as a team um, sounds to me counterintuitive to actually saying like, this is how you build a well-functioning team. But um, then I was uh, nicely surprised when I started reading the book. <laughs> but it's not just it, about it that. Almost, it almost starting from a negative point of view. And you, yeah. you, haven't you heard of positive psychology? I mean, shouldn't you have a different title? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so interestingly enough, um, his latest book is The Ideal Team Player. So maybe he did learn something about <laughs> positive psychology um, in the process. Um, so about the book, a little bit about it, um, 230 pages. It was written in 2002, which surprised me because it's extremely relevant. Um, it's kind of timeless and classic in that sense. Um, and um, it's obviously written by Patrick Pencioni. He's quite a prolific author. Um, he's written other books, um, The Motive, The Advantage, um, The Ideal Team Player, The Truth About Employee Engagement, Getting Naked, which is about kind of naked leadership. Not that way. Um, death by meeting um, and overcoming the five uh, dysfunctions of a team, a field guide. So he wrote a field guide to the specific one um, and the four obsessions of an extraordinary executive, which I thought was an interesting one. Then silos, politics and turf wars. I'm not sure if it's a guide on how to do them or how to avoid them, but um, <laughs> and um, the five temptations of a CEO and the three big questions for a frantic family. So I think it's uh, definitely worth kind of exploring as an author. Um, and he likes this. This is written as kind of a business novel or a business fable. Um, it's the way that he pitched it, a leadership fable. And it really is a story. Like, And so it was really difficult for me to summarize the book. So I'm going to tell the story, <laughs> if that's OK, <laughs> today. The other thing is, Rian, when I, when I read this, <laughs> and look at the title, I almost had a feeling he should have called it the five dysfunctions of a relationship. Because it, it, this is not just limited to a team, this is yeah. uh, spans all kinds of relationships where you are more than one individual. It reminds me a lot of the kind of contemporary work around um, trust in organizations. So yeah. um, the, the trust is a basis for uh, really building teams. Yeah, so I, I definitely think it's a model, and I think that that's kind of its attractiveness. It's a fictional story of the new CEO and the team that she starts to lead. And um, he takes us through uh, the series of issues that um, that person now has to engage with as she encounters that new team. And um, I think what really makes it simple is that it introduces a little model that you can learn it's got five little steps and if you think about it it's it's something that you can quickly 
put into your toolkit and just pull up and ask your team, okay, so how are we doing against this model? You know, so th that kind of simplicity um, is is useful, both kind of as a, as a functional way to describe it, but also um, because it's just easy to deploy. Um, and I, I think the the story introduces a, a model for teamwork, which I found interesting in that it isn't a model about how to be a good team leader or anything like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's actually a model for teamwork. Um, and that I found refreshing and also something that we often miss. Um, for me, it was it was subtle, as you said in um, in our pre comments, to say there's a subtle thing of we we sometimes miss the fact that the team must work. Okay, um, and that's what makes this so deceptively simple, but actually very complicated. I think in systems thinking, the, the concept is simplicity on the other side of complexity, and that's what I that's what I got from understanding this because that simplicity yeah. that you see in those five little steps, almost like a recipe. It's not really a recipe. It's a it's 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 a positive narrative for team effectiveness. Absolutely. Um, so the model eventually, and we'll t talk through it, is about trust, conflict, commitment, accountability, and results. And um, we'll touch on how this, the different elements of it work um, and then where we need to go with it. Um, but this is the basic model that's, that's being built as we go on. So I'm going to take you through the story. Um, so Catherine is this new CEO um, and um, she needs to, she uses this model kind of interactively in the book to build a team. So it's like she's running a conference and she's building a team. Um, and however, we can help real teams to understand how to work more cohesively using the model. It's got those five main areas, trust, conflict, commitment, accountability, and results. And then the team learns those things collectively as a team as they're going through it. Um, and in the process, through the way that the characters are set up, obviously there's some people that leave the team, there's some people that, um, some issues and drama in the team, etc. cetera. Um, but basically, it, it starts off with the premise that if if a team can't learn how to really trust each other, they won't be able to effectively move on to the next step, which is constructive conflict, etc. So we'll go through those as it's happening in the book. So I must admit, when and I share this with you as I was reading the book, to sit and said the first chapter, like it felt like I'm reading the start of a play. <laughs> okay. um, so like you meet the the um, the the cost um, and there's Catherine Peterson. She's a recently hired CEO of Decision Tech. Um, Jeff, he's this guy that was the CEO. Um, he just couldn't uh, execute very effectively, and he was effectively demoted. Um, but he's a co-founder, and so now he's got this new CEO that's taking over from her. Um, then. Um, We've got the chairman of the board, which is this mystical figure in the background that um, kind of intervenes every once in a while um, when it's not supposed to to be like that. Then there's um, Michelle Mackey Babe. She's the um, head of marketing. Martin Gilmore, which is the co-founder of Decision Tech and also quite a stoic company worker type person that just sits in the background and growls at anybody that isn't doing it like he wants it done. Um, there's J.R. Rawlins, the head of sales. It's, um, yeah, like uh, I would kind of describe him as a bit of a gunslinger, willing to do anything, just pushing um, to sell. Carlos Amador, head of customer support. Um, somebody that's quite sharp, but not really listened to. Um, Jan Maraschino, the chief um, financial officer, somebody that's working really hard and like, getting stuff done. And Nick Farrell, um, the chief operating officer, got some ideas, um, but he's like a careerist, in my opinion. Like he's that person that's there to do everything for himself. So after you wade through <laughs> the dramatis person now, <laughs> okay, <laughs> of this very good play, um, we can kind of get into the story. 
Okay, so Catherine's this this um, boss. She's the an executive. She takes over this um, young Silicon Valley company, um, and everybody's thinking that this is going to be the next great um, company. When the company's been running for about a year or two, um, after they've raised a lot of money, um, people start seeing the cracks, and um, the leadership is not really getting it right, and um, they start missing deadlines. Key executives and key employees leave the company, and now the chairman of the um, board is looking for a kind of steady and safe pair of hands to do this. So they hire somebody that's outside of the industry, um, and uh, she's not. She was in manufacturing, not in Silicon Valley, and uh, and a slightly older person that just comes in and he just wants to. He knows her socially. Um, and she gets hired into this company. So she walks in with the first day, um, and um, the the kind of premise is that, given the team that she's inheriting, that her team seems destined to fail, and that she seems to be destined to fail as well, because she's not recognized as an insider to her industry and to her sector. Um, she's older than most of the people that she's being asked to lead. Um, she's been retired, so I mean, this for her is uh, not kind of the the, the ideal. Uh, well, well, it was maybe the ideal for her, but it doesn't seem like um, a team's buying into her upfront. And um, she's got a lack of technology experience. Okay, and um, a team is all technicians. Okay, so cool. So and, and it, on the face of it, it looks like she's received the team out of hell because it was yeah. two, two, two of them are co-founders, so they actually they own the company which she has to manage, and one of them yeah. is the ex CEO who couldn't pull it off. So, oh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, so um, that's so awkward. And um, what she does, which I think is an important lesson, the first kind of important lesson is. Um, the first few weeks, she doesn't do anything. She doesn't come in guns blazing, um, like a hundred. With start week one with a hundred day program, and outlines exactly what we're going to do. She just sits around, observes the dynamics of the team. She hardly speaks during the meeting. She actually joins the former CEO Jeff um, in his. So she asks her, "Keep doing what you've been doing," and she sits in, listens. Um, and she observes the environment. And I think that that's important because I think before you, uh, it's something that I was sharing with somebody the other day to say, you know, when you look at something from the outside, like as a new leader and you have to look in, you sometimes feel that I must just walk in and like the minute I am in charge of that, I'll start firing everybody. Okay. But when you start working inside of the team, you start realizing, hang on, but this is the people that I need to have to be successful going forward. So I need to start leveraging the opportunities with these people that have skills, experience, etc., and really understand where they're coming from. So I think it's that um, kind of first phase of of kind of a hundred day program as a new CEO is spend your kind of first month at least understanding where you where you're working okay and who do you have to work with so i thought that that was a nice um start to the to the story cool okay um so it it's it's been a while now and um everybody's surprised they get this notice that they should come for this offsite retreat two days okay um, and um, and they're not supposed to bring anything, and Catherine has an agenda. So now, obviously, everybody's rumoring and like wondering about those things and stuff. And um, Martin, which is the tech guy, um, basically says, "Well, you know, but you should really be focusing on sales." And he kind of refuses to go. And he's a co-founder as well, so you can't really tell him like um, no. <laughs> okay, but she does. She. Um, she takes charge and she tells Martin that they will have to reschedule. 
And the next thing is it starts escalating in the organization up to the point where the chairman gives her a call and says, um, you've really upset Martin, you know? <laughs> okay, and how many times does this happen? Like you you push down and you get it back from the top that you've, you've pushed. <laughs> okay, um, I thought that that's a very interesting kind of um, leadership phenomena in dysfunctional organizations is that we often go to the very, very top uh, because the, the old rule of appeal to the highest power gets invoked and um, and this guy is now upset and he, the chairman calls her and says uh, she has to reconsider her decision and she just says, well, you've asked me to leave this company and that's what I need to leave this company. So uh, kind of it's um, this way or um, or no way. Okay. And, um, and she, lack of courage on both of the chairman and on Martin's side. Man. Yeah, exactly. You know, and it's like um, you utilizing authoritative power to try to achieve something um, when it means that you're not really dealing with the issue exactly as, as you're saying. Um, and Catherine then believes that certain members of her team will end up leaving after the retreat. Okay, so she's convinced that they won't stick around. Um, and also um, the premise on which she kind of gets away is to make it clear that if the team is broken, the company will remain broken. Okay, so eventually everybody pitches up, but on the day, um, um, Martin waits to the very last minute to walk in. And as he walks in, Catherine leaves the slide. Of uh, breathes a sigh of relief because luckily the whole team's in the room. Okay, so um, I won't spoil everything, but um, <laughs> it's it's that moment in the book that, that dramatic tension. <laughs> cool. Okay, so um, Catherine kicks off the retreat by explaining she feels the team's quite dysfunctional. She draws a pyramid um, on a whiteboard and labels the bottom section trust. Catherine explains that the team can't exist without trust. Trust each other, the team must know each other's about each other, and it isn't revealed in a daily work situation. So it's not just about the work, it's about who we are as people. Um, and Martin gets on his computer, he's typing away, and um, Catherine says she's not having any of this, and she tells Martin to put away his computer. Now, this is the tech founder of a tech company in Silicon Valley that wasn't paying attention. He turns around, he says, I'm actually taking notes. She says, well, I need you to put away your computer <laughs> and be present here in the moment. They come and, he, and to her surprise and to everybody's surprise, he obliges, puts it away. So I think that those little um, barriers of trust and the small things that we need to be present in a team is actually a very profound lesson to say, if we are here to, to do the work that we need to do, we need to be here. Um, and I think, even uh, these days with teams meetings and not being present and aware, it's very easy for a person to um, look at a screen, but actually be in a totally different, busy typing a letter or busy um, running a script or um, giving feedback on a chat or whatever, and you wouldn't even know. So what are we doing to be present? And I think that's a, a very powerful thing. They do a little exercise where um, they share a little bit about their personal histories. For all of them, it's a bit of a revelation. It takes 45 minutes and the group starts to form a bond that wasn't there before. So I think the lesson in that is that we need to, to step out and really understand who we are working with. Um, I find it fascinating when you start working with new people and you find out a little bit about them because it contextualizes what you're seeing. It doesn't necessarily condone it, but at least um, you, you understand what motivates some of the behavior of people and also having shared experiences is a very important thing as a team. So I'm um, starting to build trust. Cool. Um, the bond actually starts to fade very quickly as they start to dig into their personal behaviors a bit. Um, and um, like this one lady rolls her eyes up and everybody in the group sits in, they get into, uh, a thing about she's um, she just did that and she derails the whole process by telling the group she feels it's a waste of time while their competitors are probably currently working on gaining market share. 
interestingly enough, because she brought him in line, Martin disagrees with her for the first time. And like they start to see that where this is going in terms of healthy disagreement is important. And um, Catherine believes she, at, she's a little bit scared right now in this process because she believes that she won't be able to build trust within the group. Okay, so that's a um, naturally as a leader, we sometimes look at the the material and we just think, okay, my word, um, this is not good. Okay, so it's not just about trust; um, it's about vulnerability-based trust. Um, so they kind of leave it that evening. Um, there's some people get a little bit tipsy together and things and stuff, and um, and they kind of figure out that this trust thing is really complicated. Um, and the next day, surprisingly, Catherine goes back to the issue to sit and say, you know, until we start really understand an absence of trust will lead to us feeling that we're invulnerable and we need to be vulnerable okay, to each other. So we must understand that our results depend on each other um, and that's about the groups. Um, trust and um, not necessarily about me being invulnerable, me being safe, etc. That's important. I mean, like psychological safety is important, but it is about me being safe in the context of this group. Um, she do a bit of they do a bit of a strengths and weaknesses exercise and the group provides some kind of deep answers on um, what is there. And um, everybody participates freely, um, and these are like on the individual strengths and weaknesses. So people actually tell, like, I'm really good at sales, but I suck at admin, for example. You know, um, somebody else says, well, you know, I'm great at admin, but um, I really don't know uh, my left hand from my right hand, that kind of <laughs> stuff. Um, you know, so that we kind of understand what we are working with as a collective. Well, this one person, Mikey, that doesn't really want to go there. So he said, like, this is totally waste of my time. So I think we can already predict that Mikey is not the team player here. Um, and um, yeah, at least... I, when, when, I, when I read this, I was thinking of boards. Yeah. When people come onto boards and normally they sit there <clears throat> and they are uh, supposed to be experts in their fields and where they come from. But... I wonder to what extent are there boards that really go through this exercise in terms of demonstrating vulnerability and, and how willing would a director be or an executive on the team to, to reveal, because this is, I think the word that he uses, it's, this is not about predictive trust, this is about yeah. vulnerability-based trust. Yeah. You know? Absolutely, and um, it's so interesting. Um, we obviously do a course on effective directorships, and um, what I've sometimes found with directors is that they don't want to look stupid. <laughs> okay, and they would definitely, yeah, they definitely don't want to say that. Uh, I don't know. Um, like, I, this is not my area of expertise, etc. But that's very important to put up your hand in terms of saying, well, I'm not the person to be asking about this particular area because this is not my kit. You know, we need to find an expert because I find that in, in the boardroom that can be a real liability when everybody thinks that they know what's going on or they need think that somebody knows what's going on and that's why they're keeping quiet. <laughs> you know, so then everybody keeps quiet around the issue and next thing, the motion was carried in effect because nobody commented <laughs> and so we all feigned our ignorance <laughs> and, um, yeah so this could like th th that's how do you how do you move out of that kind of absence of trust or trust space into a space that's healthy um and i, I like this next idea which we'll come up with now which is that you can easily create an artificial harmony like Oh, we look so nice together. We all sitting there looking at each other, all pretty, assuming that everybody knows what's going on. But um, that just shows us there's a fear of conflict. Okay. So um, interestingly enough, in the next instance, they kind of jump to the last um, place and um, the the last, the final dysfunction, which is about results. 
and they said she needs to them to understand that their objective as a team is to reach the team's goals. Okay. Um, so that's an interesting kind of dynamic to get right. It's like um, if we are an exec team or a board or a team, we are here to achieve the team's goals. Okay. And I found that that's a profound shift that's subtle in its complexity, as, as you would say. Um, um, because I don't think people look at their individual contributions, especially in teams that are highly functional. Um, they sit and say, well, my job is to do the sales, my job is to do the marketing, my job is to do the operations, okay? But that's not why you are in that team. In that team, especially the top team, you're there to achieve the team's goals, okay? And, and that in itself is a, a mind shift that makes a lot of teams dysfunctional that they haven't done that and um, that they, they don't really get to understanding why their team's not working because they've never asked themselves what should we achieve as a team okay not what should i achieve to contribute to the team subtle but a massive difference okay this is this is a challenge in in sales teams and i think mm -hmm. we sometimes be a, we sometimes well many times we reward behavior like this so yeah. you it's one individual that sells above everybody else. And yeah. although the team didn't make the sales uh, results for the month or the quarter, yeah. he or she did, and they feel quite smug uh, mm. in that process, but the team didn't win. And, and the classic thing is what we then do is to sit and say, well, that person's a great salesperson, but they're not really fitting into that team. So we make them a manager of another team. <laughs> Okay, and they think that that behavior is great. Okay, so they encourage individuals to perform well on their individual goals, and they don't. Nobody sits back and says, "Well, you know, what are we here to achieve collectively?" Okay, um, and I find that, the, the, especially in sales teams, you're very right. That like the, um, especially in high turnover sales teams, you you get a dysfunction happening over time. They're like nobody remembers why we are here. But we think that we are here just to perform well individually on our sales goals. Um, well, that's not the business's goal. The business's goal is to sell this product. Um, so now, profound point that you make there, Frick, and I think it's, 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 this for me is one of the key takeaways from the book is that we, um, we often confuse individual goals with team goals. Okay, um, and teams need to set goals that are relative to that team. Um, and, and there's an, another section on that as well. It's not either or, it's both and. It's, th mm -hmm. This doesn't mean that everybody can do, uh, can be, uh, achieve mediocre goals, because that you also have to achieve high goals individually to, to contribute to the team's top goals. Yeah. But how do you, how do you, how do you, design it in the such way that you actually focus on the team goals while you deliver your individual goals. Yeah, and, and, and that for me is a profound point because I think what you're trying to do is to ensure that um, we are willing to recognize um, uh, that the top goals are there, but that we need to and this is like management consultants will hate me for saying this, but people are people like when you haven't employed a person into a role, it's a role. But the minute that you have employed a person into that role, it's a person. And now that person has to achieve that role. OK, so when you now design the goals of the team, you have to look at the person. You can't just to a conceptual design of that role should be achieving this and then decide the person isn't there. For now, that person isn't there. So you're going to have to get it done with that person. Um, so the, the person becomes a, an element within the team that becomes very real um, when you have to, to look at it at this kind of level. Um, OK, so Catherine then takes them through that uh, and um, says individual results don't matter if they don't promote the team's goals, um, they can harm the team. And that if we are just working for status and ego, OK, we will be achieving the wrong things. Okay. So um, 
metaphor of a basketball team. If um, they had a, a player that was far superior to the rest of the team skill wise, although he didn't share um, the team's priorities, um, insisted that he um, be given all the good shots, all of those types of things. When his team, um, when his team lost, he still scored the most points. He was still the hero, okay, but the team lost. Okay, and eventually they benched the player, and the player eventually quit the team. Um, yeah, so it it really is about making sure that people understand what the collective goal is here, so that we we don't just look at. Um, it does get broken down into kind of as an individual, you need to achieve this, okay? But we need to work towards the the strengths of the individual in the team um, and deal with that ambiguity to sort of say, well, you know, if that's the best salesperson, make sure that that salesperson goes off and um, sells 150. We support that person, and maybe we reorganize our team um, slightly differently to say that person's good at generating leads or. Um, that person's good at um, closing, etc. And we rethink exactly how we achieve that as a collective result to the best of the ability um, of everybody in the team. Okay, cool. Um, and I found this an important point to highlight. The role of the leader in that team is that is to create a team. <laughs> okay, not shepherd the career of individual employees. The team needs to start to collectively feel, um, well, in the story, um, that this Mikey person um, will not fit into the team and that will be cut. Okay. So, um, but the, the key point is that the, the job of the leader of a team is to create a team. Okay. Um, and I think that that's also something that is often subtle and missed. Um, we, and um, you were talking about sales teams, and I see um, somebody asked about sales teams. What often happens in sales team is that you just have a, a leader that is there to try to manage performance and not necessarily a leader that is there to create a team among salespeople. So that's a, that's a big shift um, in terms of the types of attitudes and behaviors that you need to get there. Cool. We, ha we have a question, Leon. How do yeah. we encourage sales teams to achieve team goals, especially since sales teams are motivated by incentives? And, and I think it's, it's, not a, it's not a simple answer in this context, but I, 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 I do think that you have to balance the individual and the team goals so that, 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 that the individual's goals are tied into the team's goals and that there's an incentive to reach the team goals and that you don't over incentivize the individual to the detriment of the of the of the whole it's like my friend uh, elizabeth says you can't fit a lamborghini into an engine you fit the engine into a lamborghini so yeah. that, that's the that's the basis construct and for me, that was a harsh lesson that I learned in one business where I was given a goal to achieve a specific objective, um, I had to achieve a certain profit within a time frame, and I went off in my way to do that. Okay, um, and I achieved the objective, and then when I came to collect the reward, the business turned around and said, "But this other area of the business didn't make profit, so um, we can't pay you." <laughs> it's like. Well, if you just told me that, like I would have helped them. <laughs> okay, but and um, it, it's sometimes we set up, um, especially when you've got a jockey mindset. We set up a jockey to um, win the race, but we don't make sure that the whole team has won won the race. Um, and I think that that's a we can't just have stars. We need to make sure that the stars work together. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, hope that answers some portion of the question. But I really like your. Um, you should always look for group incentive structures. Um, yeah. That is um, important. So, um, and that's just kind of what happened here. This, the, the CEO started breaking people into pairs and asked them to come back with specific goals on how they can measure the team and company's results. Okay, and um, they uh, put everything together. They put it in seven primary categories, and um, just what they figured out that that they set up the same metrics that they had before. OK, so after um, all of this work, we came to the same conclusions as we've done before. 
and then everybody is there to defend their individual department successes and protect their egos. Okay, it's like I can achieve this. I'm, I've done this. Da, 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 da. Um, and then they needed to look at what the group must achieve um, to walk towards these goals rather than the individual goals of the department. And um, they were willing to speak up about the things that they saw and um, they needed to learn to say things that other people didn't want to hear. Okay. Um, so the, in order to get there, she needed to explain it a little bit more on the pyramid. Okay, so we kind of um, started off with trust and we got into a little bit of the, the conflict scenario, um, but we will get into that just now. Commitment. So to get to trust, we must be human. Okay, so we must relate to each other. In terms of conflict, we must demand debate. In terms of commitment, we need to focus on clarity and closure, which we'll talk about now. And accountability, we need to confront difficult issues. Okay, and results, we need to focus on the outcomes, not only the process. Okay. If we don't have trust, we will be invulnerable. If we fear conflict, there will be an artificial harmony. If there's a lack of commitment, there will be ambiguity. If we avoid accountability, there will be low standards. Um, and if there's no attention to the results, um, eventually we just move into um, status and ego. Okay, so that's the kind of basic theory you know, and that she then started explaining to them. Okay, so the second dysfunction. So what is conflict? And what is this artificial harmony? Um, so we started talking about it a little bit earlier. Um, when you get to that tension where we are being too kind of each other um, all the time and we just saying that we're not willing to engage in constructive and ideological conflict um, we just there to support the status quo to say that everything is good and not really challenging each other and when there's a challenge to take it personally okay now obviously if there's no trust you can't have those conversations okay so um uh, recently in one of my classes I um, this guy said well you know I was deployed into this environment and um, I got there and everybody I, I started offering advice and the next thing is they all telling me to they don't want to listen to me anymore and I've been hired as the expert how do I resolve this okay and it was exactly this because um, you step in somebody asks you for advice and inherently you create conflict but you do creating conflict outside of the circle of trust. Okay, so by you creating conflict first and not building trust first, you kind of, the organizational DNA kicks in, um, says that's a virus, you better get rid of him quickly because yeah. he's gonna make us sick and they eject him. Okay, so how do you get beyond that? You need to build the trust so that you would do the, the conflict from within as a space to, to understand Look, I'm not necessarily here to um, kick you out. Um, I'm here to make sure that um, we achieve our, our goals as a team and within the parameters of that, you're safe. Okay, so let's now talk about what are some of the things that um, we haven't been talking about. And then this um, Carlos, the head of operations, brings up the topic that the group has in avoided to engage about whether they should outsource IT um, and all of a sudden they could start having a meaningful conversation around that okay because now it's because IT was always Martin and Martin is one of the co-founders and they because of that they didn't really want to talk about it um, but now because it's a level of openness they can start engaging around that and and move beyond an artificial harmony which says that IT is working eventually as well they figured out some other stuff's not working as well okay. and that is the, that is for me when when i went into the second dysfunction mm. and, and i saw that progression when i when i started realizing in terms of this book this is where the profoundness is because it, it, it is it is it's almost a prerequisite because in the absence of that vulnerability trust how do you how do you push boundaries uh, mm. how have Conf a healthy conflict in, 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 in that space, you know, and you yeah. can actually speak your mind. Uh, I think one of the concepts that we use nowadays is psychological safety. Yeah. So, so how do you create that without, without trust in that space? And then how do you act trustworthy to, to, mm. to 
maintain that kind of healthy conflict in, in, in that space. Yeah, you know, and it's, it's I think, especially now, um, and I'm, I find that in the last five to 10 years, I think the mindset in, in companies have changed. But I mean, in, 90, in the 90s and 2000s, um, there was a mindset of executive warfare. Like, if somebody tells you something, uh, you must find a way to use it against them, you know? Uh, <laughs> that's kind of um, um, the kind of viciousness of, of uh, that was in the mindset there. But I think we, we don't live in that age anymore. And we now all have realizing that, hang on, organizations depend a lot more on our collective strength and how we are building that. And if we're going to utilize, I guess what I'm trying to say is if we um, entertain the type of behaviors that um, allows people to shoot each other off, okay, then we are violating this this principle of, of the safe space. Okay, um, so the, the, the leader that thinks it's this, turns around and says, but you raise an interesting issue. Um, but by the way, weren't you responsible for that? Yeah, with the intention, the next view is like, I'm building a case against you because um, remember the, what I did to the last guy that we did this to. Yeah. Are you going to engage? Okay. But if it is, there's sa psychological safety. The same thing is like, but weren't you responsible for it can lead to the point to sit and say, yes, and here's the 12 things that I think we need to do about it going forward. You know, so that and that's the difference between success and failure as an organization, I think. And it allows you to admit your either your ignorance or admit your mistakes. Yeah. Uh, whatever is needed as a, as, a, as a constructive contributor to the team, I admit these weaknesses, but, but it's fine in this vulnerability trust. I, I will be forgiven, but I also take the responsibility to correct this or yeah. ask for help. And, and, and I think that that's an important aspect is, is a willingness from a team culture perspective to sit and say, okay, we, it's okay, we realize that this is our current situation, we're not going to dwell on the past, in, we will in as far as it is important to understand what's going on, but we will focus on the future. And I think that, that um, we should not have, that shouldn't create the fear of conflict. Okay. Um, and I think that that's the, the interesting. So we should demand debate. Um, it shouldn't be an artificial harmony that we just think that everybody is cool and awesome. We should actually sit and say, but hang on, think about this because that's going to have an issue. Okay. So um, people didn't really understand, obviously, um, um, commitment. And it's not, commitment isn't about consensus, it's about buy in and allowing everybody to explain their point of view during conflict. The team understands our commitment builds on conflict, which builds on trust, needs to um, lead to the last dysfunction. And they start talking about their, their issues relative to what they're experiencing, start inviting different people's comments on, on everything and get this richness around what's actually going on and how it impacts different portions of the. Because the reason why people are in that team is because they bring different perspectives and they bring different elements to the equation. Otherwise, they can just go off and do their individual contribution, which isn't great. Okay. So that once a group is committed, they must hold each other accountable, which is the next level of dysfunction. Okay. So maybe I'll just step back one. So a lack of commitment leads to ambiguity. Yeah, because the person says one thing and they go and do another thing. <laughs> okay. Um, so that, I thought, was also an interesting... Um, it's exceptionally important, Rian, I think. I mean, even if, if you are an exco or, or whatever and, you, and, there is, and you, you have a trust environment, you have the necessary conflict, and it, no, you, you don't seek consensus necess necessarily. If it happens, it's a bonus, but that's not what you're looking for. But then once once you have allowed everybody to speak their mind, you as a leader, you have to take a decision. You have to make a decision. And when you make that decision, then as a team, you commit to that. Even if you disagree, I mean, this is not about moral issues. This is about business decisions. We are going yeah. that direction or that direction. It's not about ethics or whatever. That, that's a different yeah. issue. We're going this direction. So then my my attitude in that team ought to be, I disagree, but I commit because this is what we have decided to do. Yeah, no, fair. Um, I think 
there's there's an interesting element in what you said, which is important, is not just to agree, okay? Um, but it is a point around we need to agree on what we've agreed. I know that sounds like quite like, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, just to sort of say, yeah, okay. So, and, and that's how she built commitment in the team. She actually listened to what everybody had to say. Then we summarize that, take it back in terms of saying, are we agreeing that this is what we've said? Okay. Because then those become the fundamental kind of building blocks, which we we are committing to this, okay? Because we've all collectively agreed. And if there's anything in there that the implications of is unclear or isn't supported or you don't agree with, um, we need to move from those building blocks of, of fundamental agreements, you know? So I think that's where you, um, the fierceness of the debates needs to come in to sit and say, look, if we put up that number there, if we put up that outcome there, if we agree as a collective that that's where we're going to end up, okay, then, and we commit to it, come hell or high water, okay, that's how we do things. And we will do it collectively, individually, and respectively. And if you turn around the following day in terms of saying, yeah, but I wasn't really on board with that. <laughs> And you have a corridor talk around that, and next thing there's a there's a fist fight. Um, don't be surprised. Okay, that's not a, and that's not a team player. That that's almost cowardice. You know, it's going to. Uh... But that that's classically, um, yeah. That that's classic executive behavior, though. I mean, yep. <laughs> that's not, it's not, um, let us not be ambiguous about that. That's what the executives, yeah, no, uh, well, but I told you that I might change my mind, you know, like, and next thing you sitting there and this whole organizations in opposition, um, et cetera. And I think what, what can happen is executives can have a disproportionate impact on the attitudes of, of everybody around them because they just, walk out of the room in terms of saying, well, you know, this is what we talked about, but I'm not really on board with that, you know. Um, and that becomes what people defend throughout the organization. Um, so it's better to, in the team, agree on what do we agree and have the fierce fights there, but when we walk out... We committed. We, we committed. Okay, yeah. that's it. That's that's done. Okay, so... And in, in building this conversation that you are sharing with us now, it's it's actually great because in, in that conflict moment, if we have enough trust and we have really fierce conversations in a safe space, mm. we we stand a very good chance to cover all the the, the, the aspects of this thing and, and, and limiting the the possibility of returning back to square one. Yeah. But if, if you lack that conflict, that that healthy conflict and conversation, if you lack that you increase the possibility of taking a wrong decision. Absolutely. It's almost like in the mindset of we need to iterate the issue here because if we can go through more iterations and solve more problems here right now, that doesn't have to hit us later. Yeah. No? We can't obviously let that stifle us into inaction. Okay. So that's the, the other thing that can happen in inertia and we just live for the debate. <laughs> okay, we kind of need to keep the end in mind here. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we have, I've seen that in organizations as well, where they become so really good at being fierce that they forget to do <laughs> business. <laughs> or we'll do this meeting <laughs> before the debate, you know. Exactly, cool. exactly, exactly. So, um, um, Okay, so once the group is committed, they must start holding each other accountable to that commitment. And this type of, of accountability is primarily behavioral. Okay, so, um, and Martin recognizes that Catherine did this to him at the beginning of the offsite by telling him to turn off his computer. And it's the hardest when you have to do it to somebody that you view as your peer. Okay, so when you have to call out a peer in terms of saying, but you know, I don't really think that you're present or I don't think that you're giving this to due attention, or why did you keep quiet in that? Because now you're t telling me another story. You know, that's the kind of stuff where we have to hold each other accountable. Um, so, and you can't hold each other accountable if you didn't cement the buy-in or the commitment. Okay, so that's why it's important to reaffirm and crystallize and clarify that commitment, because otherwise we all end up failing um, because of that. 
they talk about that. Um, how do you get, start a good conflict? Um, There's a good guide. <laughs> and um, that's really a question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, there's, um, and she, she basically said, you know, the, what you have to ask yourself is why do we have meetings? Okay. And if meetings aren't there to, um, she basically says, would you rather attend a movie or a meeting? Okay. And you should rather want to attend the meeting because it should be interesting, fun, engaging, and it shouldn't be tame. Okay. It should be, um, interactive and really bring people's abilities and perspectives to the fore. And you know, how many times do we actually design in a certain sense our meetings um, to be that? And I think that that's a challenge to everyone here for the next week <laughs> is to go off and design a good meeting and see if you get more out of it. Um, and um, in that meeting also something that's very important is listen to the quiet ones ask everybody to give their opinion, um, really take one issue, be fierce about it and get to a point where there's a collective agreement around how do we resolve this. You know, that's the kind of stuff which then makes those meetings meaningful, engaging. And um, it's like, remember that meeting we had in the third week of October in 2021, we said this, okay? And that's the types of meetings that you want where the, the outcomes are meaningful and the agreements are collective and um, it's engaged everybody in it. Okay, so, and that's cool conflict. I, I like that type of conflict. Um, so they picked an overarching goal. Um, they started talking about it and um, they actually debated each other around this particular goal. And in the end, they actually agreed on the goal, 18 new customers by the end of the year. Um, and, um, and then the group said, well, to get there, we're gonna have to stop all of these offsites. And Catherine just said, no, okay, you know, we're not, if we're not a good team, um, we're not gonna stop. Like, we're not gonna stop working on us as a team um, to sacrifice that for the goals. If it's the team needs to achieve the goal. Okay, so that's a small thing, but it's a massive, massive mindset. <laughs> okay, so then say, look, we are a team and we need to achieve this goal because immediately, and to the question earlier is to say, if we don't make sure that the team gets there, did we achieve the result, you know? Um, cool. And, um, Great. And then they started focusing on the group results and um, the CEO of, CEO of a company comes later. He says that he wants to buy another company and the whole group kind of shoots him down a bit. And he said, well, I'm not really achieving my results and why I'm here. And um, Catherine tells him she needs to think about that uh, or he needs to start thinking about it, that it's not about his goals. And um, what then happens is um, they, the salesperson quits okay, um, because he, when he hears that they now have to go find these 18 new customers, he's really upset about that and didn't really like the offsite. And um, turns out they have a fierce and honest conversation and it turns out that he wasn't really good at sales anyway. <laughs> Okay, which would have been nice to have the fierce conversation earlier because then they could have worked out how this all works. Um, but um, she now looks at towards Nick to sit and say, look, if you really want to achieve something, why can't we look at what can you do here? You know, so it's still our team. We still need to achieve this goal. You've got the best skills. How do we make that work? You know, so also very profound points around um why do people do things um connecting to their desire to achieve etc so um subtle stuff some interesting lessons definitely worth um reading about um cool and once again it's about the goals of the company or goals of the department okay so um and there's an interesting dimension here around like this team as a an executive team needs to focus on the goals of the executive team, okay? Not just bring their department into the executive team. I think we talked about that a little bit in the beginning, but it comes around in the, the story again, okay? To sit and say, 
let's be clear, the company needs to achieve its goals and it's not at the expense of, of a department achieving its goals. Okay, uh, we need to work on the collective. Um, and um, they start talking about the strategy of the company, how that comes together, and um, then they, based on this kind of realization that we really truly need to achieve the, the goals of the company, they start hammering out a real strategy and not just collecting the strategies of the individual department in a bigger picture. Okay. And then I talk about accountability. I won't go into that a little bit, um, give you a, something to read about. And teams that aren't accountable if they're not committed. Um, so we, we did talk about that. Interestingly enough, um, a couple of things happened. Eventually they fired Mikey. Um, we heard about that. Um, the, the guy that was there that wanted to go buy the other company, the other company came to um, make an offer to buy them. And they said no, because they committed to their team. So team, the team committed to the team and they believe that they were there. And then, um, yeah, teams commit to each other. Um, and then the book kind of zooms a, a forward a couple of years in which decision tech becomes, um, they tie it for first in the market, okay? And the only thing that was different was that they started um, operating as a team. So um, I think, and I, I know we talked a little bit fast through the end, but I think that the message is clear to say, look, um, to build a team, you need to build trust. You need to utilize that trust to really engage with the issues. Um, once the issues are clear, um, build that commitment. Once that commitment is there, um, make sure that we are working collectively um, to walk towards that by holding each other accountable, to supporting each other, um, and really making sure that everybody contributes to their part. But none of that will be meaningful if you haven't done the first couple of steps and the results is the group results. Okay, so relatively simple framework. Okay. But the prof profound framework, it's simple yeah. to, re to remember, but you have to dig in and, and familiarize yourself with what is the content of each of those steps and, and especially how they link to each other. Uh, and if you think that through and you go and view your current team, uh, either it's an exco or a senior team or even a, a, a team on the lower levels, the same dynamics apply in that space. If you really want to do that, go and view it through these lenses because yeah. I, that would be insightful. And what I um, what she then also later does is she just pulls up the framework and, and pulls it to a team and asks, how are we doing against this? Yeah. Okay, so that you can utilize that almost as a diagnostic after you've done the initial work, okay, to sit and say, let's um, trust, et cetera, et cetera. And if the team then says, well, I don't think we trust each other anymore, then at least you can have a meaningful conversation around that, okay, and um, start setting a clarification on what is, what's there. So it's a, it's a bit of a process map as well, and a bit of a measuring tool as well. Um, so I found it from that perspective kind of a very useful little trick in the bag um, and also a, a very powerful um, idea in terms of making sure that we we constantly measuring our team against a set of principles. And I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with taking these pic this picture um, and utilizing it as a kind of diagnostic to say, you know, are we being human? Do we demand debate, focus on clarity and closure? Do we confront difficult issues? Do we focus on outcomes? Yeah. Um, oh, I'm seeing that this person's got a lot of status and ego. Okay. Am I paying attention to their results? Okay. Um, I'm seeing that there's low standards here. You know, are we avoiding our accountability, et cetera? So it's a diagnostic tool in that sense as well. So quite kind of useful in that. And then kind of the commercial break at the end, which we always do. And um, thanks for to everybody for entertaining us with that. Um, you can learn about these things in the courses office by uh, SGI, obviously, um, where we do a lot on managing teams in a very um, around a positive psychology and also um, getting the teams to work. Um, we've got a course on leadership and emotional intelligence in terms of the emotional intelligence required to do this um, management development program where we design for our companies very specific interventions where they're 
maybe have a group of people that need to go through something like this or etc. Um, oh, we've got managing talent. Um, it's talent um, and the workforce. <laughs> Sorry for that. And you should, uh, have said, you should have said that's the Latin word for talent. Oh, like no, that. I, just for clause, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, but um, managing talent in the workforce, which this is a very important element of, um, and how do you create that environment? Also, we talk a lot about this in advanced diploma and project management. And um, then we also want to do a shout out to our um, our company, Edgevice, where um, anything in the BCom space um, we would definitely touch on this type of, of structure. So um, if you're looking for a bachelor's degree to do that with, we also work with them um, on that. Um, yeah, so that's kind of our story for today. Thank you for joining us and I'm looking forward to connecting with you. I believe that there's an interesting director's hour coming up if you want to talk about that very briefly, Frick. Yeah, there's a, there's a director's hour coming up and we will share the information. It is, I don't know the number, but it's the ISO out on governance that is out and we will discuss that in great detail with our partners at Fluid Rock. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but uh, the the details to be to be mailed to the audience uh, very soon. Cool. And um, we'll let you know what our new book is soon. And um, probably thinking about there's um, a, a, a book that we reviewed earlier um, where there's a follow up, which I'm thinking about if we can do that one. And um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us again. OK, um, go out there in the world and build good teams. Please. Thank you, thank Brian. You. Thank you. Uh, audience, I see the people have enjoyed it. Uh, go out, buy the book, because I think there are very nice exercises in the book that could help you to gain more insight into what we have said. And uh, looking forward to the next book. Cool. Thank you, everybody. Cheers.